Hello, welcome to Furious Driving. Now you join me today at the wheel of a Jaguar S-Type, a car that was maybe not as well received as it could have been back in the late 90s, but over time has become quite a good looking thing. Now this car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics in Kent, so head over to the website in the link in the description below and check out this and other interesting stock. And if you like seeing reviews of this kind of car, then please do hit the subscribe button below. Now, on with the car. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're looking at the car which didn't exactly redefine Jaguar for the new millennium, but certainly evoked plenty of memories of the last millennium for the new millennium. Yes, it's the S-Type from 1999, which ran until 2008. Now, when people think Jaguar, they generally have one of two impressions in their mind. Either it's golf clubs, upper management, well-heeled, well-to-do, tasteful people, or they're thinking bank robbers and people who dump bodies behind railway arches and haystacks in country lanes. Now, whichever one of those demographics you may fall into, Jaguar were trying to appeal to the masses by harking back to their glory days of the 1960s, and they wanted to reimagine the S-type of the 60s to grasp that wave of retro-futurism that was engulfing the world in the 1990s. So this car was actually designed by Jeff Lawson back in 1995, and it was launched at the same NEC Motor Show as the also retro-inspired Rover 75. And at the time, people were generally saying that they preferred the Rover 75 as it was less of a pastiche of an older car. Although time has been kind, the Jaguar now has grown into its looks and now looks less retro and more just of its time. Now looking at the styling of the car, there's lots of cues from both the 90s and the 60s. The 90s gives us long, flowing, gentle shapes and curves, and of course these long lines during the length of the car. And the 60s gives us the twin headlights, the grille, these scallops into the bonnet. Interestingly, you could actually specify a leaper, a Jaguar to stick on the front of the car. It was an option only, um, and it was designed to break away so it passed safety testing, but it does make the car look very, very, ret not beyond retro, just kind of old fashioned and a bit pastiche. Just having the, uh, the, the face, the growler on the front, it uh, actually makes it look a bit more modern and a bit less of a trying too hard to be old fashioned. Now I've got to say, I do actually rather like how when you pop the bonnet, instead of the grille going up with the bonnet itself, so you crash your head into it every time you look under there, the grille stays there, you have a great big cutout in the front of the bonnet panel, which is really clever. Now there's a couple of different engine options on this car, mostly petrol, a couple of diesel. This one though, is the Junior, the entry level, the two and a half litre V6. There was also a two and a half litre twin turbo diesel, a three litre V6, a four litre V8 petrol, and of course, the big daddy of them all, the supercharged V8 petrol, which for, for many is the one to have. But if you're just driving the car day to day, this with its better economy and 197 horsepower is plenty good enough. Mind you, the performance range is quite wild. This one will do 0 to 60 in about 8.6 seconds. If you go for the supercharged S, you can shave three seconds off that and do 0 to 60 in just over five seconds. Now, if you like a touch of originality, you will enjoy this. This car was supplied by a Lancaster Jaguar in Riverhead, just outside Sevenoaks, which is about 15 miles from here. So the car has stayed very local, and I do love seeing these original dealer touches on a car after a few years. Now, there is a story which I would love to think is true, but I'm sure it's apocryphal, that Americans couldn't pronounce Jaguar properly because they would read this on the back of the car, and it's got the button for the lock or the boot release here in the center, a little Jaguar face in the middle of that button there. And so they would pronounce it Jaguar, and that's why Americans can't say Jaguar properly, apparently. Now coming around the back of the car, we see more of 90s meets 60s style and design. The way this bumper and its inserts wrap around here are reminiscent of the shape of the old chrome bumper of the 60s car. And front and back, these little side repeaters are very much for the American market rather than the European market, interestingly. And Jaguar do like to keep a styling element going, don't they? Because this little crease on the top of the rear wing going into this uh, almost a pressed in spoiler on the back of the boot. That was present in the old XJs, the XF, the latest XJ. It's a very, very present and clear Jaguar styling item, really. Let's have a look in the boot. And this is your typical big executive car boot. It's not that deep, but it goes way, way, way forward in there. It's a long way until you hit the back of the rear seats and they do fold 60-40s so even though the aperture typical of a big saloon like this isn't that huge you can put long loads through there. Uh, under the floor we have got a space saver spare wheel and a toolkit and the biggest battery you've ever seen. I think the same ones in my C-Class and uh, big Saabs and that kind of stuff. And adding useful stuff like lash down points was a bit of a novelty in the 90s in some ways. But we have got little hooks that you can hang things on both sides left and right. There's an elastic a strappy thing for holding stuff tight on the right hand side and there are a couple of little lash down points here at the back. 
and there is even a light in the tailgate so it shines down into your boot over here on the left though because we are extremely posh in this car we've got a jaguar branded cd changer look here is a spare caddy so you can take oh i can't get out of the bag twice as many cds in your car pre-loaded so you can flip from one mood to another with just a new caddy of discs and these door handles look very little for the doors. They're very sleek and curvaceous and they fit the style perfectly. I wonder if they're parts been from something else. There is the uh, traditional now Ford tiny weird key. Now climbing in, it is a car of luxury. Lots of leather, lots of wood, deep carpet everywhere. Very, very nice and very accommodating. Let's have a look at this door before we climb in. We've got this beautiful bird's eye. It's a bird's eye maple in the, the gray finish. Isn't that lovely? Sitting on top of some leather, more le leather on the door arm. Huge speaker area down here. Huge speaker enclosure covering who knows how many speakers in there. Uh, solid, nice metal door handles. Everything you touch has got a feeling of you know, class, distinction and quality. And uh, down here we've got a very dinky little door pocket which is carpeted on the outside so it looks nice and you don't leave foot scrapes on it. But only hard plastic on the inside, interestingly. Let's climb aboard. I do apologize for the road noise we've got today. I chose a very bad place. Now we have got more of this lovely wood. Bird's eye maple, I believe it is called, as I say. And this is the unusual gray color. Jaguar did do quite a variety of options in terms of colors and finishes on their wood. And I do really quite like the, the blacks and the grays. They look very understated and quite sporty without going carbon fiber and aluminum. It's a nice way of doing things. Uh, starts at the top. First of all, we've got the biggest tea shelf you ever did see. I mean, look how far back all that goes. It vanishes. I can't even reach the windscreen. So you can have a full three course meal up there. If you're, going, if you're looking for a car to picnic in style in, look no further. Comfy leather seats, massive tea shelf. Awesome. Then move into this beautiful slabs of wood. This is reminiscent of the Rover 75. It's hard to believe the guys designing the Rover 75 and designing this weren't copying out the same book because the way this all looks and fits together is remarkably similar in many respects however whereas the design team at rover wanted to make everything as perfect as they possibly could the people at jaguar were slightly hamstrung by being part of ford's group and they had to use a lot of ford switchgear and parts lots of things around the car do look kind of fordy but it is well hidden by the clever use of leather and of course the timber that makes it all well hidden. Now let's move over to the instruments. And we have got, because British racing heritage, we've got racing green backgrounds on the dials, which is quite exciting. Uh, not a massive over the top instrument cluster section. Now the dashboard in its entirety is in one big sweeping lozenge, which ends little pointy curvy air vents left and right. So we've got one here and obviously one over there. And moving forward, we have got our switches, which are obviously from the Ford parts bin. Then we have this panel down here for other minor controls and the trip computer. And you have little curious poppy outy buttons for your headlamp leveling and for your brightness of your dashboard. Which is something you don't really see anymore is poppy outy buttons that you turn once they've popped out. How curious. Also down here, Following on from a Japanese influence, perhaps, we've got the opening buttons for the boot lid and the, uh, the fuel cap. All hiding above a very well hidden little carpeted cubby right down there. Ideal for losing coins and sweets in. Moving back into the dashboard, we do have this, again, curious round uh, keyhole, which is for the Ford Group Key, which is that thing of the 90s. Now we move back to the steering wheel. The steering wheel is rather lovely. It's typically Jaguar, the four stubby spokes with a big center section. You've got the, you've got the Jaguar face staring back at you, bared teeth. Apart from the Dodge Ram, this is the only animal facing you in any car badge because it's considered too aggressive and standoffish by many people in the design world. The wheel itself is chunky, grippy leather, got perforated leather here and there. It's very nice to hold. And we've got more leather facing the plastic dashboard. So we've got this rubberized area here, the, the leather textured uh, rubbery plastic over on the main dash, but then the surround of the, uh, the console is actual leather. So it kind of becomes the bit you will touch and brush your hands against is real leather. And the stuff you probably won't touch is made of plastic. Clever little bit of design there. 
This is very similar to the XF, this whole horseshoe thing. Apparently there was a, a refresh around 2003 which changed the look of this. I think this is the later one. So in here we have got dual zone climate, we've got the big radio and telephone of course, which is all posh, a CD here as well as a CD changer in the boot, and then we have got heated seats left and right, and big shiny ashtray, look at the chrome that's hidden underneath there, you know you're in a classy car when you've got a big chrome ashtray, and unused ever cigarette lighter, that's always nice to see because it means that you know the car is going to smell nice. Then we've got the traditional J-Gate Jaguar transmission. Slop it through there and the sport button for making that two and a half litre V6 do sporty things. And this is a new thing. I think this is 2003 as well, when they went from a traditional handbrake to the electronic handbrake. Boo, bad move. I do dislike these things on every car in the world. Now this is an interesting little bit of stuff just here. This armrest slides back to reveal your cup holders. So if you don't want to be looking at anything as ugly as cup holders of the modern world, slide that forward again. Whoops, which is a little awkward to do, but there you go. I want to get the knack of it, it's all good. Underneath there, we do have more storage and a 12 volt outlet. Let's move that forward. There you go. Then we have these seats, which I don't think I've really spoken about at all. They are big, padded, bulky, comfortable things. It's like being in like a proper, comfy leather armchair, but these big bolsters mean that you're well gripped so because this is a Jaguar so therefore it is sporting as well as luxury it will grip you nicely as you go around corners and if you push the car through a bend these will hold you well but at the same time if you're just cruising around they are deeply comfortable big deeply soft the padding is thick the leather is soft to touch everything is rather sumptuous about them now one final interesting note the driver's side has got lots of buttons on it for windows memory seats mirrors that kind of stuff the passenger side has got a different thing entirely it's got the one window switch then it's got a tiny ashtray how curious that's something that is completely at odds with the uh, turn of the century now here in the back we've got more of this lovely soft leather we've got more of the wood we've got ashtrays in the doors again again this is something that really is reliving the 1960s because no other car from the 90s has got ashtrays in the doors anymore climbing in Oh, it's a bit tight around the rear head axis because this sweeping roof line does kind of cut in a wee bit. But once you're inside, you are very comfortable. Lots of legroom, lots of headroom, lights on both sides for you, big storage bins for your important paperwork, individual air vents both sides, and a useful little cubby hole area. So yes, lots of comfort. Even the rear parcel shelf is very heavily carpeted, so the whole thing is a reeking of luxury and comfort. Right, let's fire up the V6 and get going. Now although the V8 was very much a Jaguar product, the V6, the V6 was more Ford derived. It's based on the Duratec engine, but that's not a bad thing because it's a powerful, reliable engine, which works well in a lot of situations, including this one. Now, although the V8 options in this car were very much Jaguar derived, the V6 was actually uh, based on a Duratec engine, which is uh, one of Ford's global platform engines. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing because that is a great power unit. It's nice and powerful, it's nice and reliable. And it's a good thing to have in a car. So that's not derided for that at all. And that's a, that's a positive. Now this car is built on the Jaguar Ford DEW platform. D standing for D class, E standing for E class, that is large family slash executive, kind of a crossover sitting in between the two sizes, and W for worldwide. This also underpinned the Lincoln LS and the Ford Thunderbird, incredibly. So quite a variety of cars sitting on this one platform. This platform actually replaced the DE1, which is what the Granada Scorpio or Mercure Scorpio was sat on as well. With the sport button pushed, it really wants to fly and drops the gear, kicks down happily, and that engine does sound nice. But then when we drop out of sport again, it's all very quiet. And the loudest noise is the uh, the tyres thumping over the bad surface, really. Barely any wind noise. Just a little bit of tyre rumble. It's a very civilised place to be. Now 
as I say, the styling of this car is something it really has grown into over the years because for a long time, the retro look was, well, it wasn't really in favor anymore, not in vogue at all. As the millennium changed and towards the end of its run, it really did look very old fashioned indeed. But as time has gone by, things have changed. The retro look is now no longer such a bad thing. It makes it a little bit timeless in a way. It now looks kind of elegant and a bit cool and retro in a different kind of retro way. Retro for a different decade to the first retro it was retroing at. Funny how time works. I do like it more in the sport mode though. See the revs rise a little bit here, the engine note just lift. Right, we've engaged sport. Let's try. Not to 60. Well, not to 40, because that's the limit. That does pull away quickly. It's amazing how quick and smooth the car is. I know it's a good deal slower than the, uh, the fastest car in the range, but it still feels extremely rapid pulling away. The gearbox shuffles through the gears very happily. You know, I'm no great fan of automatics. I may have mentioned it previously, but this does do the job fine. There was a manual option as well. It's a six speed and certainly in the later cars, which uh, personally, I think I would, uh, I would go and seek out, but that's just me. Especially if it's a sporty saloon like this. Now something I've noted on later Jaguars like the XJ, the XF, is uh, how the headlining and the, the window top seems to cut into your vision a little bit. And this does it a little bit here as well. This A-post comes back a very long way and it feels like it's right close to your forehead on the top of this uh, post where it drifts off there. So it's not actually claustrophobic, but you do feel like you're sitting quite high in the car on this seat, and this roof line seems to come down quite low in front of you. The dashboard is very long, very deep, so the steering wheel is quite a way back as well. It all feels very much like you're pushed back in the car, a bit like sitting in a, like a vintage racing car almost. Our rivals to this car were things like the E-Class and the 5 Series, and to a certain extent, because it's that crossover size of slightly in between at the top ends of the C-Class and the 3 Series but also of course back in the 90s you would still have rivals from Saab with their 9.5 offerings from the Japanese market and the French maybe even an Alpha 166 but the, the feeling, the ride, the ambience of the Jaguar is totally different from any of those rivals this has got that old school gentleman's club vibe Whereas the other cars tend to be going for more of a, a modern, well, car-like feel. Apart from the Alpha, which is just all on its own. And the Saab, which is a bit weird as well. Let's hit that sport button again, because the open road, got that Volkswagen stinks. Now the steering is tight and light. There's a little bit of weight behind it, but that's just enough to give it a nice bit of feel, really. The ride is surprisingly hard for a, a luxury car. It does feel quite taut, but they've done a good job of not making it bouncy and jittery. It's actually very comfy. So it feels like you come straight from a long cruise down the motorway onto a track day, hurl it around Brands Hatch for a couple of hours, and then drive it home again in comfort. Of course, the layout is traditional executive car format. The engine's at the front, the drive is to the rear. And that does mean that if you do hit some nice fast corners, you can have a bit of fun with the thing. Now, Jaguar around this time suffered from two problems. First of all, like every other British manufacturer, they had been not invested in properly for a long time. So when Ford came along and injected lots of money, that was a great thing for the company. It meant they could have investment in chassis design, in body design, in the technology in the cars. Everything could take a step up and match everything else that was on the market. The downside of that was they used a lot of Ford products and you can see the Ford products in the product. But that was stuff that worked. Because Ford is the kind of manufacturer that deals in vast volumes, they can't have problems with switches and components breaking and having to be brought back to replace um, frequently, that would just bankrupt them. So all the switches and things that were borrowed from Ford's part bin work brilliantly. And so by putting tactical, tactile leather in the right places, you don't notice the plastic so much. 
Now I'm sure by 1999 and certainly by the late noughties, most S-Type buyers probably hadn't driven an original S-Type. They may well have seen them, but they were probably less aware of what was being referenced than the designers who had uh, been referencing it. But this does well to capture a lot of essence of that original car. Those were lithe, they were fast, they had fantastic suspension and great chassis, certainly very ahead of the day for the time. And this does capture that feeling very well, and it does feel like a special place to be. It's not just the fact they've put wood on the dashboard and leather under your bum. Lots of cars do that, but there's an indefinable something that makes a Jaguar just feel a little bit something more. Well, thank you for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this rather nice luxury sport sedan, as we would call it in America. I say we, they. I wouldn't call it that at all because I'm not American. If you have, please do hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.